Welcome back to the Agentic Schools Manifesto. This is Chapter 10, A Local to Global Strategic Plan. To review, we have inherited a toxic and unchanging global system of schooling because, until recently, no one had a reliable means of discerning educative from non-educative experiences. The field has mostly depended on some version of either the notoriously unreliable, I know it when I see it, criterion, or the false assumption that attaining the right test scores, grade certificates, and or diplomas must indicate that a person is educated. The central unchanging features of the system have been the age segregation of children and a toxic grammar of schooling, also known as a hidden curriculum. The toxicity of the hidden curriculum is the result of cultural patterns that normalize the thwarting and or neglecting of the primary psychological needs of teachers and students. The harmful patterns arise from three false assumptions that are implicit in how most schools are organized and operate. Imposed authority is assumed to be a neutral component of schooling. It is actually an active component that becomes toxic when it exceeds some minimal threshold. Agency is assumed to be a neutral component. It is actually the central active and nutritive component that makes education possible. Academics are assumed to be active components. They are actually neutral, even though they do take up the lion's share of instructional time and effort. The toxicity of the mainstream cultural pattern in schools is probably also reinforced by manifestations of the exclusion delusion in which true but less well-known conceptions of learning, teaching, and schooling are blocked bureaucratically from being acted upon and or are weeded out of the system over time. The lack of change in the hidden curriculum of schooling globally is understandable given these misconceptions. This means that the system has been operating on incorrect navigational feedback about where it is and where it needs to go. The individuals who make up the system have been doing their best, but without good navigational feedback, they've failed to recognize that they've been educationally lost at sea all along. Reforms have been ineffective because no one has been able to reliably know where they are, let alone how to get where they want to be. Educative results have happened, but they occurred in spite of the system, not because of it. Our education systems do not produce merely inconvenient or unfortunate outcomes. They produce morally reprehensible harms to people we care about. We are under a moral imperative to change the system in order to ensure that our children can thrive. The challenge of making effective changes to the system also entails having the humility to accept and integrate complex multifaceted truths about learning, teaching, and schooling. Because of the failure to recognize the centrality of agency and the toxicity of imposed authority, school, district, state, and federal policies have interfered with important decisions that must be made on the front lines by parents, teachers, and children. Given the inherent complexities of the educative task, legislating decisions from afar that should have been made on the front lines is bad policy. However, legislating thoughtful ways to ensure that there is psychological standardization across the board holds out the possibility of being a productive, positive path for large-scale change efforts. The learning tree provides a visual guide to understanding the learning process and the role that psychological needs play in it. The main point is that the science of self-determination theory logically implies that a healthy grammar of schooling must first and foremost be based on the universal satisfaction of psychological needs. Schools alienate instead of educate children because of the epidemic of disengagement. The ultimate cause of the epidemic is not the conscious thoughts and behaviors of individuals. It is how cultural patterns operating in non-conscious aspects of our minds have normalized psychological need neglect and or thwarting. Schools that normalize the thwarting and or neglect of the primary psychological needs of both students and teachers can be said to have a culture with a toxic grammar of schooling. 
changing the pattern of toxicity will require cultural solutions. Cultural solutions are organizational efforts to introduce new policies and modify behaviors. The term policy is used here in a broad way that transcends verbal expression. Side note, in various relevant fields that study organizations, there are probably a variety of technical terms that are more precise than I have used here. So if experts insert their jargon when putting my claims to the test, that is a good thing. End side note. Managing systems of education necessitates the satisfaction of primary human needs. Therefore, the cultural solutions to the problem of school toxicity must be centrally concerned with measuring need satisfaction, the patterns of motivation, and the quality of engagement in schools. The moral and political imperative of schooling today is to normalize A, the satisfaction of needs, B, autonomous motivations, and C, agentic engagement. Taking the SDT model as the basis for a theory of experience suggests that there are some basic questions that need to be answered in order to manage a school as a reliably educative environment. How well are needs being supported? Are psychological needs being satisfied by the supports provided? Are motivations more autonomous? Is engagement agentic? Which policies affect the support of needs, the satisfaction of needs, the patterns of motivation, and the depth of engagement? What effects follow from changes to those policies? What processes can teachers and students use to identify policies that might be productively changed if they know that needs are not being adequately satisfied, motivations are too controlled, and or engagement is less than agentic? What mechanisms do they have available to change those policies? What constraints on school policy are imposed from outside the school itself? What cultural patterns are valued by the various stakeholders within the school community? How can valued cultural patterns and or constraints imposed from outside the school be framed so that need satisfying features are preserved while need neglecting and or thwarting features are eliminated? Are there policies that may be causing the primary need satisfaction of one group to be sacrificed for the primary need satisfaction of another? Can primary need supports be provided in a manner that eliminates the observed sacrifices without simultaneously creating others. To conclude, I will share with you some options for how to proceed with a plan for taking local actions that can be scaled up to create global change. It is important that you take time to incorporate the new paradigm into your ways of thinking and acting in the world. There's no reason to believe that merely reading this manifesto will be enough to rewire your brain to operate in new ways. The first step is to educate yourself. While I have elaborated on many points in this book and in the book Schooling for Holistic Equity, as well as on my websites, I do not expect you to adopt my perspective wholesale. However, I do ask that you take seriously the science of self-determination theory and the central findings of psychology more broadly as a solid foundation for constructing your unique take on this new education paradigm. I refer you to a book called The Constitution of Knowledge for a Spirited Defense of the Most Basic Institutions of Democracy, Science, Jurisprudence, Journalism, and Academically Respectable Accountings of History. These institutions are constructed from two bedrock principles that are crucial to mitigating against the worst angels of human nature. Quote the fallibilist rule, no one gets the final say. You may claim that a statement is established as knowledge only if it can be debunked in principle, and only insofar as it withstands attempts to debunk it. The empirical rule. No one has personal authority. You may claim that a statement has been established as knowledge only insofar as the method used to check it gives the same result regardless of the identity of the checker, and regardless of the source of the statement. End quote. Jonathan Rausch, The Constitution of Knowledge, 2021, pages 88 and 89. In my books, I have made many different claims about what constitutes knowledge in the realms of psychology, education, and some other adjacent fields. I accept that those claims are subject to the rules of being a participant in reality-based communities. 
Independent of my personal feelings about the criticisms I will inevitably receive, I accept that valid criticisms are vital to the enterprise of discerning reality. I want to end this book by pointing you in the direction of a multitude of resources for further exploring my point of view, in the hopes that you will join me in my commitment to accepting that reality-based communities deserve to be relied upon as the only legitimate sources of reliable knowledge. One of the challenges we face is that objective reality is not accessible to our senses, even though we all have strong intuitions that it is. That delusion is universal even for those of us who accept that it is a delusion. Thus we find ourselves on the horns of a dilemma. We have the lived sense that we have direct access to reality, yet we simultaneously know that our lived sense is misleading every one of us to some degree. For many common everyday experiences, our lived sense is good enough to get by. But in the complex technological age in which we live, there are hazards lurking in every electronic device and the social milieu in which it is situated. We cannot fully protect ourselves as individuals. We must rely on institutions for protection. Thus we find ourselves on the horns of another dilemma. If we can't trust ourselves or anybody else as individuals, how are we supposed to trust groups made up of unreliable individuals? The answer is that we must construct our institutions carefully with these conundrums in mind. The fact is that the science of psychology, specifically in the form of self-determination theory, is pointing us in the direction we need to go. SDT has found that humans are more in touch with reality when their needs are satisfied and less in touch with reality when their needs are thwarted. This means that in order to maximize the ability of individuals to be in touch with reality, we must construct our institutions in a manner that facilitates the satisfaction of needs and prevents the thwarting of needs. There are likely many ways to accomplish that task. In the realm of schools, I am convinced that there are a variety of institutional forms that already accomplish that task. The type that I studied directly and wrote about in Schooling for Holistic Equity are generally referred to as democratic or free schools. A variety of other labels may also indicate schools that are on the right track. Deeper learning schools, self-directed education, holistic schools, rights-respecting schools, homeschool resource centers, agile learning centers, and many others. The following two-part plan is based on the resources I have been developing and assembling over the years. 1. Educate yourself. First, listen to the Agentic Schools podcast to learn about schools around the world that are already leading the way. Next, Click on the Tools tab at HolisticEquity.org to find a variety of inexpensive ways to continue your paradigm-shifting journey. Next, sign up for a short, free online course about the SDT model of motivation by selecting the Tools tab and then clicking on the Free Motivation Course link. Next, start using the inexpensive Instant Climate Assessment tool with your students and or teaching team by once again selecting the Tools tab and then clicking on the Climate tool link. Next, enroll in my two-part online course, Defense Against the Dark Arts, Leadership and the Science of Motivation, which is a program that is coming soon. Next, become a certified holistic leader and consider continuing your studies to become licensed as an attituder, which are both programs that are also coming soon. Finally, read my prior book, Schooling for Holistic Equity, to take a deeper dive into catalytic pedagogy and various methods of managing the hidden curriculum. Number two, advocate for change locally, then expand your impact to a global scale. First, endorse the resolution at dladvocates.org. Next, support this work by clicking on the donate button at dladvocates.org and start making monthly donations. Next, Hire an attitude or consultant to help your team implement a local to global plan for changing the world, starting with your school, and consider becoming an attitude or certified school, which is a program that is also coming soon. Finally, start a campaign to get the resolution passed into policy at your school, and then work your way up to higher levels of schooling. District, city, county, region, state, nation, multinational. I hope you will 
learn more, and take action to improve both your school and the global education system. This concludes the 10th episode of the Agentic Schools Manifesto. This episode is the end of the main body of the book. The next three episodes are the three appendices, which are only available if you are a monthly contributor to Deeper Learning Advocates. The first is called Criticism of Self-Determination Theory, which is about how to recognize legitimate criticism by breaking a poor one down and providing a summary of a good critique. The second is called Reading First Analysis, which goes into some of the details of how I investigated the roles that motivation and engagement played in the Reading First program that was a key element of education policy in the United States from 2001 through 2008 under the presidency of George W. Bush. The final appendix is called An Ecological Theory of Experience. The idea is to go into the deeper thoughts and ideas that I have had regarding how a theory of experience based on self-determination theory can be fleshed out. It includes a more detailed learning tree and discusses the possibility of mimetic engineering, which was mentioned as an extension of educational hygiene in Chapter 6. I put that discussion in an appendix because it is a technical topic and my thoughts are still developing. If you are done with the book, I understand and hope that it has been an edifying experience for you. If you would like to get the PDF and illustrated video versions of the book, it is available as a membership benefit when you join Deeper Learning Advocates for $5 per month or more at dladvocates.org forward slash donate. Finally, if you would like to know more about my consulting and public speaking services, check out my site attitutor.com. That is A-T-T-I-T-U-T-O-R dot com. Thank you for your kind attention.